Uh, welcome everyone, my name's Raphael Epstein from ABC Radio. Thank you for coming to see Peter Grester to talk about his book, The First Casualty. I do want to kick off and start the official proceedings by acknowledging that the Macedon Rangers Shire Council is on Jajawurung, Tangarung and Wurundjeri country, whose ancestors and their descendants are the traditional owners of this country. We acknowledge that they've been custodians for many centuries and continue to perform age-old ceremonies of celebration, initiation and renewal. And we acknowledge their living culture and their unique role in the life of this region. And if I can just add that it is the longest continuous culture on earth and surely in places around here people have been telling stories forever. So as tribute to them and in understanding of that culture that is a part of our nation, another storyteller here tonight, and I hope we learn just as much as I'm sure people have in places near here. <laughs> Look, Peter's book's fantastic, and it's fantastic because it's, also, it's not only his personal story, it's a, a cause, and it's about freedom of speech and about freedom of the press. So I'm actually going to start not with his story in Egypt, so forgive me, stick with me. Um, Peter, I was fascinated to read your account of Kabul in 1995, before 9-11 of course, and you meet up with people from the Taliban, including their regional commander. I was just interested in how different perhaps the Taliban was then? Yeah. It was interesting, 1995 was, was a, a kind of baseline for me of the way things have worked. Because one of the things that we've come to think of in the war on terror is, is that it's always been with us. It's been around for such a long time that it almost feels like part of the wallpaper, almost as if it were some kind of historical inevitability. Um, and yet in 1995, the Taliban came through, they swept through from the south, from Kandahar, and at the beginning of the year, um, Kabul itself was being fought over amongst a whole group of, of, of rival Mujahideen factions. But the Taliban came through largely in response to that and they, lay, they started laying siege to, to Kabul. And we went, and I was faced with a really difficult question of, of what to do, how to cover this, because at the time there were no mobile phone networks, there were no, um, there was no, even the satellite telephone system was hopelessly inadequate. And so, I felt that the only way to cover the story with any kind of balance and integrity was to physically cross the lines. I always also thought it was safer for us to do that because inevitably at some point you would, if you worked around the front lines as a white guy, you would wind up in someone's rifle sights and if the other side saw you as the enemy, then that guy was likely to pull the trigger. So we literally, sometime, one day we, we, we saw when the Taliban had arrived we waited until there'd been a day or two of relative calm on the front lines and a few civilians started crossing and we literally clenched our butt cheeks and, <laughs> and got in this, old, this rusty old Land Rover that we had and, and moved across the front lines with a big BBC flag and got to the other side and saw these turbans poking above the, the sandbag barriers and all of a sudden they leapt out and said, ah, BBC, welcome! <laughs> and, and they were the Taliban. And we sat down and we would drink endless cups of tea with them. They didn't like us, they didn't necessarily see, didn't, rec didn't like our theology, but that wasn't the issue for them. As far as they were concerned, we were legitimate players on the battlefield. We had a role there. This was a war over po a political power over land and, um, in, and ethnicity in Afghanistan at the time. And in that con conflict, we were observers, we weren't participants. I want to track forward a little bit to 2001. So before we get to you in Egypt, um, there's a group of journalists trying to get from Jalalabad to Kabul and you write about what happened to them and about what happened to Daniel Pearl in stark contrast to the way I think you were treated by the Taliban in 1995. And, and this really illustrates, and, and, and this really cuts the core of why I wrote the book, because things turned around on nine, around 9-11. The difference between Afghanistan of 1995 and the Afghanistan of 2001 for, for, for us as journalists was, was brutally stark. Um, there was a convoy 
that was carrying a group of journalists, as you've just mentioned, shortly after the fall of Kabul, and it carried uh, four of them, including the wonderful Italian journalist Maria Grazia Cotulli, who was a very close friend of mine. I'd, I'd gotten to know her back in 1995. And Harry Burton, a, a, an extraordinary Australian cameraman who was working for Reuters at the time. There was also um, a Julio Fuentes, who was um, an Italian journalist, I think, who was working for Credo Corre de Sera, and, oh, sorry, Spanish journalist. And there was another um, uh, uh, Pakistani journalist who was working for Reuters. Um, Aziz Habitula, I think his name was. Anyway, the convoy was stopped in Sarabia. It was ambushed. The Taliban let everybody go apart from those four journalists, and they dragged them into the hills outside of Sarabia, and they emptied the magazines of their Kalashnikovs into them. And in the trial, subsequently, uh, they eventually found the four guys, uh, found the, the Taliban that were involved in the ambush. And in the trial, they acknowledged that they were responsible, but they said they were acting on orders from senior Taliban commanders to kill journalists specifically, not because of anything that they were reporting, but simply because of who they were. And then, of course, you mentioned Daniel Pearl, who was kidnapped and executed, the, the Wall Street Journal reporter, who was kidnapped and beheaded by Al-Qaeda in Pakistan, and probably, I think, what was really one of the first uh, videotaped executions, um, and the first time that really the extremists leveraged the power of, of the internet so do you think that helped them to realise yeah, how powerful that video was? I think it did. I think it did. I think it made them understand the way that they could not just harness the, me the, the uh, media for their own interests, but also in a, in a really kind of strange, almost a jujitsu move, compel, use the, the Western media against itself. So you give the Western media some images that were so compelling that we had to use it and in the process, actually do the job of the, of the extremists for them, where we were not only magnifying the message, but terrorising people through the media that we were broadcasting. Did you have any... Oh, there's a really good explanation in the book. You're working for Al Jazeera mm. by the time you're arrested in Egypt, which we'll get to in a moment. But did you have any reservations? Because Al Jazeera also, they rise to prominence because of 9-11, and, and they're accused, they're, they are accused by America of being complicit. Well, no, and, and, and I think this, was, this is really important, because I think this also cuts to the core of, of the problem. It wasn't just the extremists that, that all of a sudden become completely intolerant of journalism and journalists. The West had also had, had done this, and I, to a certain extent, I hold George W. Bush responsible, because Bush, in his... In, a, in an address to Congress after 9-11, a special joint session of Congress, he stood up and he said, in this war, either you are with us or you are with the terrorists. And what Bush did in, that, in making that remark was made the conflict a binary choice. You are either on one side or you are on the other. And you remember, um, I just want to digress it for a second and go back to the remark I said earlier where this was a war of Afghanistan was a war over tangible things. What 9-11 did was introduce a war over ideas. And in that war over ideas, the place where ideas are transmitted and, and, and argued about, by definition the media itself, becomes a part of the battle space. And journalists all of a sudden are no longer um, simply witnesses to and observers in the conflict, but we become participants in it. Now Let's go back to George Bush's remark. If you crossed the line, if you spoke to the terrorists, to the extremists, um, then you became agents for terrorist ideology. And Al Jazeera found itself in a very unique position where it had all of these contacts throughout the Arab-speaking world, where it had already had a bureau that was operating in Kabul behind the Taliban lines. It was able to get probably the one interview that I wager every journalist in the world would have given their right arm for at that time, and that was with Osama bin Laden. And they were also broadcasting images of the consequences of US bombs on civilians in Kabul. And so they were under enormous pressure from the Americans who were accusing Al Jazeera of being complicit with terrorism, of being a mouthpiece for terrorism, when, in my view, they were doing what journalists have a responsibility to do, and that is speak to all parties in, in, to a conflict. Now, the Americans insisted that it was not a, it was a, there was a mistake in their targeting, but a bomb 
dropped squarely on the Al Jazeera bureau in Kabul around the time of that dispute. And, and there was a, quite a few Al Jazeera officers got hit by bombs. Yeah, there? and there was another one in Baghdad as well that, that got targeted, even though Al Jazeera thought that they'd learned their lesson from Kabul and stuck great, dirty great big signs saying media around it, but they still, they still hit it. And, and they'd also given the coordinates of, of their bureaus in both conflicts, in both in Afghanistan and in Baghdad, to the US military, so they knew exactly where the bureau was. Um, but, the, but the point is, and I suppose this is a, a way of segueing, that what, what happened to Al Jazeera in Kabul um, at the time, the way that, that it became a target, literally a target of the US, was in a way similar to what we had gone through in Egypt, where we were being targeted because we were crossing that ideological, that, that ideological line that the government um, vehemently opposed to, was uh, objected to. Okay, let's go forward to your time in Egypt, for which you are now really well known in Australia, for all the Infamous, yes. reasons that you'd rather not be well known <laughs> I for. I don't know how many convicted terrorists you have up in Kyneton these days. But <laughs> oh, you'd be surprised. Yeah, you'd be surprised. Central Victoria, man, it's pretty scary. Um, why were you sent to Egypt? What was that about? I was just covering the Bureau over the Christmas New Year period. I was treading water. Um, you remember, just to take everyone back to what was unfolding at the time, um, Egypt had gone through a period of turmoil. There'd been the, coup, the sorry, been, there'd been the revolution of January 2011, which toppled Hosni Mubarak. There'd been um, a, an interim government that had set up elections. There'd been the Muslim Brotherhood government that ran, that, uh, ran the country, the first democratically elected government in Egypt's history, that controlled the country for a year. And then there was a coup in the middle of 2013. Um, and then there was an, another interim government that was still trying to organize elections, and that was when I arrived. And so there were a lot of protests in the streets between the Muslim Brotherhood supporters on the one hand and supporters of the military-installed government on the other. Um, a great deal of political turmoil. And, and the thing is, and you'd understand this, Raf, that when journalists spend time on a story, you start to get to feel a feel for the edges. You start to know just how far you can push things before you really upset certain people in these kinds of stories. Now, I'm more than happy to probe those edges, especially when I know where they are. And I've done it quite consciously several times. In fact, I'm persona non grata in, in Ethiopia. I'm quite proud of that. <laughs> but Egypt wasn't one of those because I didn't know the story. I was only there for a couple of weeks and playing with a very straight bat. Um, on the night of December 28th of 2013, there was a knock on the door. I thought it was a bit odd. I wasn't quite sure what was going on there. I was busy playing, uh, listening to Triple J, dancing around the room. I was about to go out for dinner with a friend of mine who I hadn't seen for a few years. I was in a very good mood. Um, and there was a much more urgent knock, sort of really demanding attention. Um, I did up my shirt, walked to the door and cracked it open. And it was flung open and almost as if there was a spring behind it. And the room was filled with, I don't know, about eight or ten guys who raced in and hoovered up all of my stuff, slammed the lid on the laptop shut, um, and put everything in bags and then took me off down and into the police cells where I discovered that um, we'd been charged with terrorism offences. Is, is that the night that you are... How long did it take you to realise, after they barged into your hotel room, that you were in serious trouble? A little, a little longer than you might imagine. I mean. I initially thought, this is a mistake. Someone's got dodgy handwriting and written, um, written the, the wrong number down on the, on the arrest warrant or the search warrant. Or someone had mis misinterpreted something that we'd said. I thought that you know, it would be over in a couple of hours, they'd make some phone calls, they'd have a look at our stuff, realise there was nothing there, that they'd made a mistake, they'd apologise, there'd be a few handshakes, cups of tea, and we'd be let go. Um, it was when we went down for interrogation that I was facing the charges that we realised that actually this is pretty serious. And remember what the charges were. Aiding and abetting a terrorist organisation. Uh, um, being members of a terrorist organisation. Financing a terrorist organisation. Broadcasting false news to undermine national security. In short, we were being accused of being propagandists 
for terrorism, about as serious as you could get, short of actually rolling the grenades and pulling the triggers on the Kalashnikovs ourselves. How were you treated, it, especially that first couple of nights and days? Um, the first few nights were quite, quite confronting. Um, I was, we were put in a, a police holding cell, um, a police cell, and, and I don't know how many, of, I, I kind of suppose, for the sake of um, illustrating it, that it would have been about as wide as, as these two chairs. You can all see up here. Um, about eight foot wide by about eight foot deep. And in this sort of space, this square box, probably about as deep as from the front of the stage to the back of the chairs, there was um, a, a rather stinky squat toilet in one corner and about where Rapp is sitting there was a leaky, leaky tap and a sink and, and then there was on the wall fairly high up there was an exhaust fan with a little sort of window that, we, that was barred, we couldn't really see out of it, just a bit of air coming in. And then here there was a, there was a door and that was it. No other furniture, just bare concrete floor. And in this eight foot square box, there were 16 guys. Yeah, 16. And some of them had been in that space for the better part of six months. It was absolutely crazy. And I could see that some of them were starting to lose their minds. I mean, we would, they would be up at all through the night until four, five, six, seven in the morning, talking, going hysterical, sometimes laughing, sometimes crying, sometimes joking, sometimes fighting. Um, and it was quite, it was really confronting, really, really confronting. I think you lose your temper with them, but, uh, and I think they respect your fury, but actually the line out of that description that got me the most, wherever I turn, I can feel the pulse of at least one other person, and that's when you're all lying, yeah. sleeping. So you're in really close confines with yeah. these people. You're literally, on, literally lying on top of one another. There's no other way around it. You know, you, you, you've got someone else's head on your thigh, you've got your head on someone, someone's ankle, there's someone else's you know, knee in your, in your ribs, and it, it, it's impossible to, to, to do it any other way. As you go through the legal process, you're, you're taken into different prisons. I've never actually read such um, brilliant descriptions of different prisons, but there's a, I think it's the next place you're taken to that I was really touched by. I think it's the Torah Limon prison. You go in and there's really not much at all in your cell. I think it's, in, it's incredibly bare. And mm. then an amazing, well, amazing array of gifts comes to you from an unlikely source. Yeah. This was, and Limantora is a particularly interesting prison because it was, it, it was a prison that actually, I learned afterwards, uh, contained pretty much the, the, the leaders of the January 25th revolution, the one that toppled Hosni Mubarak, all of the secular leaders who were the pro-democracy activists. I didn't know this at the time when, when I was brought into that prison. It was fairly late in the evening and all of the other prisoners were in their, in their cells and all of a sudden I hear this voice yell out, uh, uh, Peter, Peter Grest? And I said, said yes. And, uh, um, Al Jazeera? And I said, yes. And, and all of a sudden they said, welcome to Limit. And all of a sudden there was this sort of uh, thump. And I turn around and, and there's a, a, a packet of biscuits on the floor. And then there's another thump over there and there's a, a pair of long johns. And, and then another thump and there's, there's a, a box of feta cheese. And, and all of a sudden there, there was just clothes and food that was literally people were stuffing out through the holes in their, in their, in their, in their um, prison cells and the doors. And it was, it was extraordinary. This incredible generosity and, and sense of fraternity from, from these guys. And believe me, in prison, a box of biscuits and a pair of long johns is worth a hell of a lot. They needed it and yet they were prepared to give it to me and support me. And it was absolutely extraordinary. It was, a, it was one of those moments when I realized that sort of act of fraternity made me understand that even though I was going into solitary confinement, I wasn't alone. I think it's Allah in that prison, if that's how I say his yes. name. I just wanted to read something that he says to you. You cannot make it through prison. You will not survive, certainly not with your sanity intact, unless you are able to make peace with yourself. And it's the most powerful piece of advice 
I received in Egypt. Why was that so important? You know, one of the things, one of the things you learn, I discovered fairly quickly, is that in fact, with all of the food that I had, um, there was food, there was nutrition. It wasn't always great, but it was there. We had water. And of course, one thing the Egyptian prison does very efficiently is protect you from the elements. Um, and so physically, we had all of the things that we needed for survival. We weren't necessarily comfortable, but at least physically, we were, I was okay. I wasn't being tortured. I wasn't being abused. And in that kind of environment, the greatest danger is from your own head. Prison is designed to mess with your head when you think about it. And the danger really is from the way that your mind starts to eat itself up. And I really struggled with why I was in prison. I, I recognized that it couldn't have any, anything to do with what we actually did because I wasn't guilty of anything. I hadn't had any contact that was inappropriate with the Muslim Brotherhood, certainly not been broadcasting propaganda for them. And then I started to feel incredibly guilty and started to wonder about what I had done in the past. Maybe it was God or karma or the universe or whatever that had put me there for some other reason. I think in the West we have this idea of agency and responsibility. That, and so if something bad happens, it must be because I have done something. And I know it sounds crazy now, but at the time it was really starting to eat me up. And it, that was when Allah gave me that piece of advice. And it really was a moment when I was able to say, okay, whatever, it's, however I got here, I'm not responsible for this. This has nothing to do with me and not, not, nothing to do with anything I have done and everything to do with what I have come to represent. And, that was all, and that's the point at which I recognized that this was really about press freedom. It was an attack on press freedom and not an attack on me. Most of us probably first saw you... Um on TV, sitting in a courtroom, in your whites, behind or inside that cage inside the courtroom. Um, there are these remarkable descriptions in the book about just how farcical the evidence was against you and how, I mean, it's, it's like if it wasn't your life in balance, it's kind of Keystone Cop stuff. What was it like being in court and watching a farcical judicial process being responsible for your confinement? It, 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 it's funny because at the time, at times it was actually quite uplifting. And I don't mean that sarcastically. It was genuinely uplifting because it was so stupid. It was so comical. It, it had so little relationship to any of the allegations against us that, that we thought, well, the, the judge surely has to call an end to this ridiculous farce and, and just throw the whole case out. Um, what happened? Here's the thing. They did not really care a jot for the evidence. I know for a fact, I know for a fact that the investigators never bothered even looking at my laptop. Do you know how I know this? Come on, you're the journalist. Ask me. This was, this was about, is this the song that starts <laughs> that, that, up? Oh, sorry. Oh, 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 yeah. Ask the how question. Did that, how did you know that, Peter? I'm Christa? glad you asked, yeah. Raphael. <laughs> Honestly, it's really hard to get Sorry. good, yeah. get, get good to get interviewers good these days, get yeah. good help, exactly. In Egypt, what happens is that in the judicial system, they, the, 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 one of the early stages, procedural stages, is where the judge enters all of the physical evidence into the court records. And so he's taking all of these boxes of evidence and opening up, and he pulls out a notebook and says, one notebook belonging to Muhammad Fami, one camera belonging to Baha Muhammad, one... A mobile phone, Mr. Peter Grester, one laptop, Peter Grester. And as he pulls it out, he opens it up, and guess what comes out? Triple J. <laughs> <laughs> they hadn't bothered opening it up to see what was on my laptop. That was the first time they actually started looking for the evidence on the laptop, and they started pulling out anything they could find. I can only assume that they were so confident that they would find something incriminating there that they thought, oh, all we have to do is look through his photographs and we'll find pictures of him in warm embraces or in meetings with Muslim Brotherhood figures. What they did find were pictures of me with my family on holidays <laughs> and, and, and stories that I'd done in Kenya at a time when I was supposed to be conspiring with the Brotherhood in Egypt. I mean, that was how crazy it was. So why'd they lock you up? Why'd they charge you? What'd they do it for? Because they wanted to intimidate journalists, period. I mean, if it, if it had nothing to do with, with... 
the logical disconnect was so difficult, it took me a long time for me to rationalize those two positions, the, the gap between what we actually did and what we were accused of doing. Re very mundane, boring, routine journalism and acts of terrorism. And finally, the only way I could rationalize it was because we were being, because they wanted to intimidate journalists. If they wanted to, a lot of people have said, well, perhaps it was about Qatar's interference, supposed interference in Egypt. Um, well, if that was the case, it made no sense to arrest an Australian and two Egyptians. And likewise, if they wanted to make a point about Al Jazeera's malfeasance with the Muslim Brotherhood, again, why would you arrest an Australian who had only been in the country for two weeks and had absolutely no personal connections whatsoever with the Muslim Brotherhood? There are plenty of journalists, very good journalists, who were doing their jobs and who had, their, had books thick with Muslim Brotherhood contacts as a part of their routine work and who you could have constructed that kind of conspiracy theory around. But me? Made no sense. And, and so this was the only reason I could think of, that this was about intimidating the press. I don't want to let it pass that you're in prison with hundreds of other people and my overwhelming impression when reading about you in prison and about the trial is that, <clears throat> excuse me, that justice system is, well, it's neither a system nor just. I mean, what's going on for all of the other people in prison? Are, is anybody locked up on solid grounds? What, what, what are those prisons oh, used for? There, are, there will be some locked up on solid grounds, I suppose. But there was a wonderful analyst, a guy called Hisham Helia, who described it to me once really well. He said, the Egyptian judicial system is, not in, is, is autonomous but not independent. In other words, it was set up under Hosni Mubarak um, because Mubarak's main centre of political power was the interior ministry. And it was set up to do one thing very efficiently and that was plug in um, political opponents to, to um, Mubarak at one end and spit out convicted terrorists at the other. And it does that on its own. It's designed that way. That's the way the thing is engineered. And there, at the time that we were arrested, there were about 20,000 other political prisoners in there on, on political charges. I, I might note, however, and I will tell you what the Egyptians say. They said that they never arrested any... They don't have journalists in prison. They never arrested any journalists. They just have terrorists in prison. Of course. I was really fascinated by the way that you coped with prison, uh, and there were two things that I'd like you to talk about. Let's start with Vipassana meditation, because you that is a reasonably gruelling thing. For someone who hasn't been to prison, that's a reasonably <laughs> gruelling thing to have done, but you that was important for you. Yeah, it was. In fact, I, I credit it with actually saving my sanity. Look, one of the things... Um, Vipassana, for those of you who don't know, I... It's a fairly hardcore um, introduction to, to meditation. I'd been through a very difficult um, relationship breakup, and to try and steady the ship, I went and did a Vipassana course. And Vipassana is, involves 10 days of really hardcore, silent meditation. There's no reading material, no writing material. You've got to sit and really focus for 10 days. And when I did the course, I came out of it with a lot of those kinds of mechanical tools. I understood the processes of what I needed to do, but I don't really think I understood the psychology of it. But when they put me into solitary confinement and closed the door and said, right, you're on your own, I realized I've got the tools for this. I've been here before. I, I, know, I know what I need to do to get through this. And one of the powerful things about Vipassana is that it asks you to step outside yourself and watch yourself almost in, as an observer. It's, it's, it's a very a-religious uh, form of practice. It, it simply asks you to watch and observe and recognize reality for what it is. You're looking for... No, I'm, do, I'm going, uh, following up on something. But no, yeah, keep okay. going, keep going. Uh, there was a moment when I was getting really angry, and I think this is a... This is a really interesting illustration. Certainly for me, it was a turning point where I was getting so cranky, so bitterly angry with the people that had put us in prison. Um, I'm not sure if I can call them assholes up here in, the, <laughs> in, in rural Victoria, but that, that's the way I came to see them. I was getting angry that I couldn't have the job 
that I wanted to do. I couldn't have the life that I had before. I couldn't do the things that I felt that I should be doing. One moment in Vipassana, when I was meditating, I remember thinking, hang on a minute, what I've done is that I've created this fantasy world, this idealized memory of what I of what my life used to be like, but edited out all of the crap bits like the traffic in Nairobi and the rows that I occasionally have with my housemates and my um, and, and, and the office politics and all of that kind of boring stuff that we, that we forget makes up the mundane bits of our lives. Created this idealized fantasy and then I was angry that I wasn't in the fantasy, which was nuts. I mean, really crazy. And I also recognized that the guys that I was angry at, they weren't aware of my anger, they didn't feel it a jot. And even if they were aware of it, they didn't care about it. It, it. it affected them not one iota. And the only person that was being damaged by it was the guy inside that concrete box. And that was me. And so what I did, what I was able to do is just recognize it for what it was as a legitimate human response to that, the situation we're in and not, not screw it down and deny it, but say, okay, I'm not going to play that game any longer. How do you think you made it through? Do you think you're tougher than no, other people? No. So what I'm no got you through? Anybody. No. I, I, look, I, let me indulge myself and say that I think, a bit of mind reading here, but I, I'm pretty sure that everyone in the audience today at some point has asked themselves the same question. And that is, how would I cope if I had to deal with 400 days in prison? I know if I was where, sitting where you are now, I'd be asking the same question. And I know my answer before this would have been, no way. I couldn't cope with four days, much less 400. Now, I don't think I'm anyone special. I have had the privilege, though, of having my limits tested and discovered that actually my limits are far further out than I ever imagined possible. I think everyone's are. I'm just lucky enough to have learned that lesson. Why did they let you out? My mum and dad. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 and and I, I, that's not a facetious thing. I mean, genuinely. I, I, it was because of the political pressure, the massive political pressure. The Free AJ Stuff hashtag received three billion impressions. Billion with a B. Now, to be fair, my family were probably responsible for half of those. <laughs> <laughs> But, and I know that Australians fell in love with my mum and dad. In fact, there's a reason that I, I don't bring my parents to these events, because if I did, I wouldn't get a look in. <laughs> you, you'd be, they'd have to book out the, the football stadium here for that. Um, people identified or recognised or felt for my plight, but they empathised with my parents. And it was because my parents had that capacity to communicate. Now, it's a real shame, I think, that 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 was one of the things that really changed the dynamics for me and not others who, didn't, who weren't lucky enough to have advocates for them that were as, as emotive and as powerful as mine were, but that was a part of it. And because people recognised um, or empathised with my family, they got on board. And because they got on board, the politicians had the weight behind them to put the pressure on the Egyptians, and so there was this sort of cascade effect upwards. And in a way, this is also the point at which I'd like to say that if you ever feel that by sending out a tweet or you know, some hashtag or putting something up on Facebook, it's, it's a meaningless gesture. Now, on its own, perhaps, but collectively, this stuff works. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that. I'm fascinated that in the press release that came with my copy of the book, President Barack Obama and the former Prime Minister Tony Abbott are both mentioned. I mean, they made representations on your behalf and that they're significant I, I assume that is part of, mm. just as, as long with the hashtag campaign, they were a part of what got you out of prison. Absolutely. But and your fact, book is very much about the things that their governments have done. Do you f how does that make you feel? Well, I mean, the, the complexity, we were talking <laughs> about this earlier, the complexity of the world. Look, uh, Pe Barack Obama I have a lot of time for. In fact, um, I met him after after we got out, um, well, he was still president, and, and he, he told me that he, he personally spoke to President Sisi many times, and I know, I know that he did. I know that he campaigned. He pushed very hard for us. And so I've got a lot of respect for, for him at a personal level. But also, what Obama did, 
is really follow in a way the same kind of trend that the Egyptians were following to a much lesser extent, but he was still doing it nonetheless, where what the Egyptians were doing was were using the war on terror and massaging and stretching the definition of terrorism to cover those of us in the media that were, that were reporting on these disputes and accuse us of being agents of terrorism. What Obama did was use national security legislation. The, the, the Espionage Act, for example, was written in 1918, in the dying days of the First World War, as a way of protecting the US from foreign spies. It does what it says on the tin, the Espionage Act. And from 1918 to 2008, in 90 years, it was used a total of five times. And in every case, it was to go after foreign spies. And we're talking about all the way through the Second World War, the Cold War, the Korean War, Vietnam, or all of those conflicts. It was used five times. From 2008 until Obama, the end of Obama's um, uh, presidency eight years later, he used it ten times, twice as often as all of his predecessors combined. And in almost every case, it was to go after either journalists or their sources, not because they were revealing politically, or sorry, um, uh, secrets damaging to national security. They weren't telling the Russians the battle plans for, 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 for warfare on the Western, on, in Western Europe or, or sort of CIA counter-terrorism strategies to Al-Qaeda to Al or, or Islamic State. It was because those journalists and their sources were, were revealing things that were politically embarrassing. And that's the thing that is concerning me. And that, I think, is really the overall or the underlying theme of the book, that what happened to us in Egypt was an egregious example of the way that governments are massaging and stretching the war on terror to chip away at some of the fundamental elements of our democracy. It's not just Egypt. It's not just Turkey or China. It's the United States. And guess what? It's also happening here in Australia. Now, I'm not suggesting that we're about to come become Egypt or, or Turkey anytime soon. Please understand that. But I think that in politicians' rush to defend our shores from, from the scourge of terrorism, which is perfectly legitimate, what we're doing is undermining the very system that has made our country one of the most stable, peaceable, and prosperous places on the planet. That, that, that's a system where we have a robust free press capable of, holding, of keeping the bastards honest, of holding the, the powerful to account. We have a balance between the power of the state and the rights of the individual that has served us remarkably well for 200 years. Guarantees of free press. And now what we're doing is chipping away at that, at those foundations, in trying to protect, this, in, in, in trying to protect ourselves from, from terrorism, which to me seems kind of rather perverse. Why do you think that's appealing? Uh, I mean, things, people will be aware of things like the metadata mm. legislation that's already happened here and, and the discussion around locking up kids mm -hmm. at, for two weeks mm. under suspicion, maybe as young as 10. But to, to stay away from the specifics of that, why is that appealing? Because it's the easiest thing in the world for politicians to be wedged on national security. No one likes to be seen. No, no politician likes to be accused of being weak on national security. And if you oppose some kind of incremental step to, to protect us from terrorism, which by its very nature is visceral, it's in your face, it is terrorism, that's what it is. It, it's politically very easy to do that. And because of the culture of secrecy that inevitably surrounds the security agencies, it's also very easy for politicians to say, listen, our, 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 our intelligence agents, we can't tell you too much about the why, about why, but trust us, it's important, we need it. And we can't really have a proper open debate about whether or not it really is true, and whether or not in introducing the metadata legislation, for example, we might actually be, do, be doing serious damage to the capacity of journalists to protect their sources. But that's what's happening. And if we're doing that, then journalists can't do it. They, they, we can't do our jobs and hold the politicians to account. Do you see it as something that is intrinsic to the system or is it something driven by the personalities of politicians? I, because once you've got an intelligence agency, maybe they just want to do I, their job better. Or is it 
at, per, at the personal agenda of a politician. I don't, I don't think there's a conspiracy here. I, I really don't. I mean, I think politicians would like to have more authority. I think those in, in, in a lot of the government agencies would like to be able to have more tools to do their jobs. And, and there's that sort of continual tension, but that's also why we have those, the checks and balances in the system that we currently have. Um, and so I'm not saying it's, 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 a, it, it's, a, it's some sort of grand conspiracy to introduce or impose some kind of authoritarian regime on Australia. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about, though, is the political imperative for politicians to be seen to be responding to terrorism robustly and forcefully. Mm. Um, the trouble is that that is perversely what terrorists, what the extremists want to do. There's, there's this remarkable... Um, there's this group that calls that talks about the grey zone. And by the grey zone, what they mean is the space that our democracy has to operate, the, the space where we can have robust arguments amongst ourselves. We can disagree with each other without fighting. We can coexist. We can have a pluralist, multicultural, multi-religious uh, society. Um, it's, it's, the, it's the space that we need for democracy to work. And you know what the organisation is? It's not Amnesty International, it's not Human Rights Watch, it's not some kind of um, pro-democracy group. It is Islamic State. And we know this because they told us. They were, they, they, there's a big cover article on their online magazine called The Beak called The Extinction of the Grey Zone. And what they want to do is to try and eliminate the grey zone by forcing a wedge in the middle of our society, to, to make it a binary state. And, and do you know who they quoted? in that article in support of their, of their case, who said, that the one man who they said is actually helping us eliminate the grey zone, it was George W. Bush. With and us or against us. You're either with us or you're against us. It, it, in that case, there are, you're, you are either on one side or the other. And so what we are doing in, in tamping down press freedom, in tamping down freedom of speech, in chipping away at civil liberties, in prejudicing Muslims, what we are doing is the job of the extremists for them. And that to me seems weird. That's not something I feel good about. Look, you'll get a chance to ask Peter some questions in a moment, there'll be some microphones, but I just wanted to take you back to, I think, the experience that we all find um, most fascinating and also the hardest to understand back in, in prison. I was fascinated that there's a book by Viktor Frankl uh, who's actually quoting Nietzsche, I think. Yes. Those who have a why to live can bear with almost any how. So those who have a why to live can bear with almost any how. Why were things like that so important to you when you're locked up? Um, Frankl is a, it, it's, it, he's a really interesting character. How many of you... How many of you have read Frankel, Frankel's book? Yeah, I can see a few hands going up there. Frankel um, was, rather curiously, was um, a Jew who survived Auschwitz. Ironic reading that in, in the middle of um, a, terror, a, a prison full of, of Muslim terrorists, supposedly. Um, and he, he, was, he was, you know, remarkable, um, remarkably well equipped as a, as a psychiatrist, or a psychoanalyst and a neurologist to understand or really study what it was that helped people survive the death camps. And he said that those who have a reason to live, who have purpose and meaning for the suffering, who can apply, who can find meaning in the suffering that they're experiencing, can put up with just about anything. And that's the, that's the how that he was talking about. And for me, when I read that, I realized I have the why. The why is press freedom. For me, that was the reason that I was in there. I had a responsibility to, to, to fight, not just for me, not just to try and get myself out of prison, but as a representative of all of the thousands of journalists that I, in my own mind's eye I could see stretching out behind me, of all of those who would come under pressure if we weren't able to, to win this fight, of all of those who were being intimidated as a result of our incarceration. And once I had that, the rest of it just became mechanics. It was just stuff that you had to do to get through the day. When did you first realise that you were out? I know you, you get out, but does it take hours or days before you realise that it's 
it's over. Um, it took it took a while to it was it was I suppose it was well I mean mentally I, of course obviously logically intellectually I understood the moment that they sort of said you're you're free to go I, I got it but you know on the day that I was released I was actually I was so convinced that they weren't going to let me go that I actually was about to tell my brother that we're going to start a hunger strike. Um, I thought that they were met, I thought they were just playing with us. I thought that they were just playing games. And I was running. There was a place that I used to, to exercise, a, a, a sort of corridor up and down between the cells that I used to run. It was about 30 meters, and it to do these endless shuttle runs for hours. And I was running, trying to work out what I was going to say to my brother, work out our, our strategy for the, for the hunger strike. And a guard calls me over and says, the boss needs to speak to you. So I went over to the, to the warden who was standing in the garden outside the cell block and he said, um, I've got some news for you. Pack your things, you're going. And I said, what? He said, yeah, you're going. I said, what, you mean I'm moving prisons? And he said, no, no, the embassy staff are going to be here in half an hour. Get your stuff, you're going home. Yella. I thought, what, what on earth is going on? And it's, it's, I, I compare it a little bit to, to Christmas. You know, if you're a kid with Christmas... You count the days down to December 25th. You, you get prepared for it. You, get, you, you, know, you go shopping for presents. You imagine the day. You get all excited. You can barely sleep the night before. And you wake up the first morning and you just dive into those presents and you, you have a fantastic day. But imagine if all of a sudden one day you just wake up and you see these gifts at the end of your bed. And it's like, are they really for me? Am, am I going to get into trouble if I, if I start opening these things up? It's like, what, what's going on here? And it really took a while for me to understand that actually this was really over. I, I went to Cyprus for a, a couple of days to decompress and, and sort of you know, understand a little bit more that actually it was over. But it was really only when I got stepped off the plane in Brisbane at, at two in the morning and I thought nobody was going no one's going to show up I mean it's just it, you know, it was it, it, there'll be some insomniac photographers perhaps a few people from the morning TV shows t who will show up um, a couple of desperate freelance photographers maybe I just it was just wall-to-wall -wall people that showed up there it was absolutely extraordinary and that was when I knew it was over uh, look, I've got plenty of my own questions. Um, may as well applaud him. Thank you. Um, I actually had a picture in my mind. It's in Notting Hill, where Hugh Grant opens the door and there's all the photographers. <laughs> and just it was someone with less hair, <laughs> more journalistic hair. Better thing. looking, come on. Oh, that, that look, well, of course, it's just the hair that everyone that fills everyone. Hi, Hi I'm Mike. Um, two questions. Um, perhaps you're travelling and unexpected, unexpectedly you glimpse a prison. What's your first and your second thought? And completely unrelated question: What state is the ABC in, in respect of government interference and perhaps balance? <laughs> uh, he can ask the second question. <laughs> I'm asking questions. Raf can, can answer the second question. <laughs> I'm happy to answer that if you want, but you're here to see Peter. Look, I, um, I'm I am a lot more sceptical of of judicial systems, of prisons, of course. Um, but equally, I also have a lot more empathy of people inside prison. I recognise that we have to have them. Um, but I can also see what prisons do to people's psychology and, and it, it isn't, I mean, I'm, I'm very, very lucky that I came through it relatively unscathed, but one of the reasons I came through it was because I had, I had the why that we were speaking about, Frankel's why, um, and I also had out, extraordinary outside support. I knew that we had literally millions of people around the world who, who actually cared about what we were going through and who recognised the injustice of it. But there are countless people who are doing this on their own. And believe me, this is, it is soul-destroying. It is crushing. And I really think that we overuse prisons. Um, I recognize the need for prisons as a deterrence, as a form of punishment. But equally, I think we are far too quick to, to, to go that route. Um, I, I, I recognize that's a controversial answer, for, but that's generally how I feel. And you, you ask that question. Um, on ABC Governance... <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm happy to answer the question. I'll just try and keep it brief, though, because you're here to see Peter. Um, I don't see significant political interference. I think 
trying to legislate for fair and balanced in legislation is just, I mean, it's just sort of the weak thing that all governments do. They wanted to get media reforms through, so they decided to throw One Nation a bone. I have suggested on air to Mitch Firefield that actually, if they want to change the ABC Act, it should be fair and balanced according to the weight of the evidence. It says balanced according to the weight of the evidence in our editorial policy. So that's like our internal guidance document. And I said to the minister on air, you should put that in legislation. Because then if anybody wants to come on the radio and say climate change isn't real, actually, actually by law, I give you one second. And everybody else who actually acknowledges climate science gets the rest of the program. Um, I don't see that as a significant problem. I don't, um, so that's enough for now. I don't see, I don't see political influence. Budgets, different. Who knows, next time it comes around. Conservative governments and sometimes Labor governments like to cut budgets. But editorial independence, I don't see too many threats yet. But I don't know, if Peter, if you know. Uh, I, look, I think, I think that there is, there's, there's, we, we need to protect the ABC. You know, there, every, and one thing is that there is, I think there is, maybe this is, I can say this in a way that Ralph can't, I think in every news organisation there is a political culture that, that defines and shapes the way that you think and see the world. And that's, I mean, we're human societies and, and inevitably we, in humans, we're political animals and, and you end up with a group of people together and they end up evolving a political culture. But if that were, if that were a problem, then everyone in News Limited ought to be locked up as well. It's just the way these things work. Um, but one, the, what, what happens is that governments tend to think that, and bear in mind we've had conservative governments for quite some time, they think that if we're getting a rough run then it's because they're biased against us, when in fact the fundamental role of journalists, whatever their political stripe, is to criticise, is to, is to ask difficult questions and to always interrogate governments. And the ABC does that very well regardless of party in power. And I think that's what we need to remember. Um, maybe we'll get a question up the top there. Oh, there's a gentleman standing up. Go for it. Hi, Peter. Thanks for coming. Um, and so much respect for you going through what you did. I've done Vipassana as well, and I really appreciate you using that for a force of good to get through your experiences. Um, my question is, can you say something about how your book has addressed US imperialism using the war on terror as a discourse to get away with, say, a million casualties in Iraq and the use of terror I'm and terrorist I'm as going to, I'm, a I'm, us and them kind of situation? Yeah, I'm going to... I mean, there, there's, there's a, it's a really big, complex question. What I'm going to do is that the, the politician's trick of, of acknowledging your question and asking the one that uh, I'd rather answer. <laughs> um, and, and, that, and that is... <laughs> the, that question... And that, that is about the way that I think that, the, it's not so much, it's the way that the government has used the war on terror. And by, de, by defining it as a war, what we did after 9-11, what we did was that we gave ourselves the psychology of war. We, we locked ourselves into, this, into the tools of war. The, the, the language of war implies certain tools that we use to prosecute war, armies air forces, gunships, special forces, uh, tanks, you know, all of those sorts of big macho things that look really impressive when you're a politician standing on the top of a tank talking about victory. But what it does is that it denies all of the other possible tools that you could have used. Now, if, let's, let's invert the question and think about how, the world, the, how different the world might have been if the US had treated 9-11 as a crime of mass murder. That wouldn't have precluded all of the tools of war, what it would have done is meant that we dealt with it as a, as a crime, using the tools of law and order. Of, we would have had far more um, investigative powers. We would have dealt with it mu much more narrowly. Wars are, 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 are conducted against entire nations. It was the war on terror that has got us into this situation, this kind of clash of civilizations. If we dealt with it as a crime of mass murder, it would have been specifically at individuals. And it's not just governments that have bought into that, the media bought into it. We, kept we keep talking about the war on terror without really interrogating what those words actually mean, the kind of layers of meaning that, that are buried underneath it that are implied when you use that simple, single, three-letter word, war. And that's where I think we've, we've kind of allowed ourselves to be led down the noses by the rhetoric. As journalists, we haven't done a very good job, I think, of, of, of really interrogating uh, 
the language around that war. And I think that's one of the reasons we've been able to get, or we've gotten ourselves into the kind of situation that we're in at the moment. Hi, uh, my name's Tony. Um, Peter, based on what you've just said, uh, what do we actually need to do to declare peace? <laughs> yeah, that's a very good question because one of the problems with the war on terror is that it is a war without end. You can't ever, I mean, there's nobody you can sign a peace treaty with. There's no one who can surrender. Um, it's, it's a very good friend of mine once quipped that this is a war on an abstract noun. <laughs> you know, and, 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 it's, and it's indefinability. I mean, every person in this room, I wager, will have a slightly different definition of what terrorism is, much less some poor guy sitting in a village in Afghanistan under, under American bombs. Um, and, and because we've all got a different understanding of terrorism, we're never going to be able, never going to be sure when we've actually won this thing and we can declare it over. Um, I don't have an answer for that. It's the war on terror has become so much a part of our psyche at the moment um, that I, I, I don't see how we can roll back from that rhetoric and start thinking about it a bit differently. It'll take extraordinary political courage for someone to stand up, a politician to stand up and expect to be elected on a, on a promise to. To, to stop talking about the war on terror and start talking about, you know, dealing with, with criminals. Um, I, and I, but I, I think at some point, and this is where I, I, I am critical of, of well, myself and my colleagues, you know, all of us collectively in the media, where we need to start changing the way that we start reporting on this stuff and interrogating some of those, some of that rhetoric. Um. If we go back upstairs, I can't see where the mic is. Right at the very bottom. Oh, there he is. Great. Stuff here. Thanks, Peter, and thanks, Raf. And I just want to start my comments. My name's Jenna, and I'd just like to thank you for speaking so courageously about what must have been a very traumatic and long-going traumatic experience, and it must take such bravery to do what you've done tonight. So thank you from the heart for what you've done. I want to ask you about social media. You talked about the way it was such a powerful tool in your case. What about the people controlling social media? and the things that they might be doing and the way they use the information that we so readily share and the, the tool to actually mobilise big mm. groups of people and the concept of Mark Zuckerberg as POTUS. <laughs> yes. Um, did, has anyone... I, I actually did a Four Corners film on just this, um, particularly focusing on Facebook. Um, let's, again... I, I, we've got to be careful about... about thinking in terms of grand conspiracies. I don't necessarily think Zuckerberg is sitting there in, in sort of some dark room sort of plotting for his own um, political, you know, to take over the world. But if you think about the mechanics of what Facebook does, and Twitter and, and all of social media, is that they design algorithms to push to the surface the stories that they think are going to be of interest to us. Now, they're of interest to us because they're also of interest to Facebook and Google and Twitter because the story, they want us, they want our eyeballs on their social media sites so that we see more ads, so that they can sell more product, they can, they can sell more advertising and get more revenue. That's how it works. It's, that's the way the system is, is engineered, the architecture of it. And, and so the algorithms are designed to give us things that we want, not stuff that we need. A good editor of a good newspaper, or an, an editor who's putting together a news program for the ABC, sits down and thinks, okay, these are the stories of the day that we're going to have to put in. We know, we know that people might not necessarily be interested in, in economic policy, but it's important that we know and discuss it, so we're going to put it up there. How many of you have up? How many of you have looked on Facebook and Twitter and seen stories about Australian economic policy? Yeah, <laughs> it just doesn't happen because that's not stuff that engages us. You know, we see stuff that um, is, is, is salacious. We see things that are going to rile us up, that are going to keep us involved and engaged. And usually that's not the moderate, boring, middle-of-the-road kind of discussions and discourses. They're the stuff out on the, on the fringes. And so Facebook and Twitter and Google prioritize those extremes and we end up in these kinds of shouting matches. Um, I think what we need to do at the moment, and what this is doing is damaging public trust. It elevates fake news to a point where it looks like just like regular news. There's no on online, 
all information looks equal, but all information is not equal. What you see from, from some bloke who, from some obscure, sort of politically driven website, well, look, fake news is designed to do two things. One is to get us to buy stuff or to influence our politics, and it is deliberately fake. It's not sloppy journalism, it's fake news. Um, the Las Vegas shooter story, um, there were, I saw a story that suggested that he was a recent convert to Islam, but the, but the media, the mainstream media was suppressing that fact. And then, of course, there are all those stories that suggested the whole thing was a fake. Um, the fact that when you look on Google and Twitter and see those stories means people start to lose confidence, think, okay, well, I know that's, that's generally probably bullshit, but oh, maybe this guy was a Muslim, um, a Muslim convert, and maybe this stuff really is, has been... Uh, and once you lose trust in that, once we can't even agree on the basic facts of any given story, how are we supposed to agree on the solutions? And so we need to re-engineer the system somehow. I don't know how it is, by legislation or whatever, but we've got to redesign it so that we can make sure that we, we get the quality news and information and independent, fearless journalism that we need so that you, the voters, are properly informed about what it is that politicians are doing in our names. And we should never forget, they work for us. Um, 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 I'll, we'll do one more question. Um, sorry, that question was up there, wasn't it? So let's get one down here. Oh, th thank you, Peter, for coming. Um, I'm just wondering what happened to the other two uh, Egyptians who were with you? Um, those guys uh, are happily out and, and, and free, free of, all, of all charges. What happened was that, uh, it's a little bit complex, so bear with me, I'm going to tell, how to tell this story though, because we, were, we appealed our original convictions. On the 1st of January, we won the appeal and our convictions were overturned and the Court of Cassation um, ordered a retrial. A month later, uh, just before the retrial was due to begin, I was removed from Egypt on an executive order and sent away. Much to my surprise, two weeks later the retrial began and I was named as a defendant in that retrial. In, in absentia, the judge for some reason didn't seem to understand that I, was, I wasn't, why I wasn't there, he kept asking for me. Uh, yeah, it was a bit weird. Um, all three of us then, my two colleagues who were in Egypt, um, were, they were released on bail but they still had to churn, turn up for the, for the uh, court hearings. We all went through the retrial again and at the end of it all, we were all reconvicted and resentenced to prison. They went back to prison for about three weeks, but after that, three weeks later, they were pardoned and released, and all of those charges were gone. I, I'm still a convicted terrorist, and I still have an, a, a prison sentence to serve. As far as the Egyptians are concerned, I'm a fugitive. I'm probably the first fugitive terrorist, like I said, you've ever had here in Kyneton. <laughs> and I'm very proud of that. <laughs> Um, look, put your hands together for Peter Gresta. Thank you. Visit wheelercentre.com for the best in books, writing and ideas from Melbourne, Australia and the world.